Our speaker this morning is Mr. Andrew Parker, founder and CEO of Papa. Throughout his career, Andrew Parker has focused on healthcare innovation that brings care to the consumer. In late 2017, Andrew founded Papa as a curated platform of, of companionship and support for adult learners. Wow, this is a great turnout for a stormy uh, Miami <laughs> Tuesday. So thank you all for being here. I first want to start by giving you all a hand of applause for really uh, coming and making sure that, that we relaunch the Mike Fernandez series in, in full fledge. And I want to take a point of personal privilege and thank Mariam. I've been at the college for about eight months now. And uh, Mariam is my boss and, and someone who uh, allows me to do crazy things at the college and make sure that we can be entrepreneurial in what we're doing. And this series would not be possible without her leadership as our VP of External Affairs. So thank you again for always allowing us to dream big here. Uh, and to our team, Tarsha and Liliana and Cece, thank you for helping us to put together a wonderful event this morning. And all of you who are here with us today. Andrew, welcome to the Idea Center and welcome to Miami-Dade College. Thank you, happy to be here. <laughs> we're really excited that you're here with us and that we're getting a chance to talk a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Miami's situation right now with uh, uh, tech startups and, and especially the health tech industry. Uh, and we'll turn it over to our audience for the questions that they might have. Awesome. We're gonna spend a little bit about, about an hour together this morning. I'll start us off with some questions, but I wanna hear from you all. So please get your questions ready. Uh, we have a mic right here. Uh, so if you do have a question, we'll return we over to Q&A. Come on over to the mic, ask your question. Uh, this is really informal and it's meant to be for you. We have a lot of students here as community leaders. This is your chance uh, to learn from a startup founder and to understand how a business is uh, launched and grown. So make good use of it and, and make good use of this time. Andrew, why don't we get started telling, you, telling the audience and our, our students a little bit about you and a little bit about uh, what was really your motivation uh, to start Papa? Sure. Yeah, no, th first, thank you everyone for having me here. I'm very excited about this. Uh, the Papa office is just you know, five or seven blocks. I was saying that if it wasn't raining, I would have just scooted over uh, <laughs> on my e-bike or e-scooter. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I'm from South Florida, so Florida guy. I grew up in uh, Fort Lauderdale and Plantation and uh, went to Florida State for finance and not too long ago was sitting in a chair like you all looking at some guy up here that built some cool company that I thought was really exciting. So um, I never thought I would be the guy sitting here in front of you all and so just you know keep chipping away at your journeys. Um, just a little bit about Papa. I started Papa like five years ago. It was originally to help my grandfather, my Papa, who was from Argentina. He came to um, New York originally maybe 63 years ago. My mom actually is the first American born uh, on that side of my family. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, but that's for a later discussion. You can take classes here I at Miami take... Dade College, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, actually, not a bad idea. Um, and my grandfather needed help and assistance, and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but you know, at the time I was working at a startup that my dad actually started that was initially really small and grew big, so I learned a lot there. But I really was just trying to solve a personal need. My grandfather needed help, he needed someone to care for him and drive him and spend time with him. He needed me, but I was busy working and in school and doing other things you know, that my cousins was, were doing. And so I thought, what if we pair Papa with, a, with like a pal, like a friend, and we could, Papa doesn't need bathing, he doesn't need toileting, he needs a friend. So I put on Facebook, who wants to be a pal to Papa? It was not this viral explosion, nothing happened. Um, but like five people liked it. And so I reached out to those people and they're like, oh, my cousin or this person's family member, my neighbor would do that. And we found a nursing student, a pre-med student, uh, actually going to school around here. I, I don't, I think it was either Miami-Dade or FIU, but within this area. Uh, and uh, we paired them and he absolutely loved it. He completely loved uh, the pal. He didn't feel like he was being cared for. And it was like, wow, if I could convince Papa uh, to use this, maybe this is actually a business. And so tested out building an app and 
about six months later, I said, you know what? I got like five people to use Papa, and the five people that used it really, really loved it. And if I quit, I, I, you know, I'll get 10 people to use it, and then I'll just, we'll go from there. We'll go to 20, we'll go to 40. And for me, naturally, like, I'm very good at convincing myself of things, and just intuitively, it felt logical. If I, you know, through osmosis, got 10 people using it, through luck or whatever, uh, you know, if I put some focus on it, it's gonna work. Just because I'm like, you know, a hammer and a nail, and you just, I'll just keep going until someone agrees. You know, I don't know whether or not I was annoying them or showing up enough times where they just said, you know, okay, fine, we'll, we'll do it. But I was able to get, you know, people going. And so I quit my job to focus on full, full time. So South Florida guy, learning, you know, every single day, um, you know, didn't grow up in Silicon Valley, never heard of Y Combinator, never heard of incubators, didn't really know what fundraising meant didn't have any, you know, real connections. I thought I had connections, but none of them helped me. Um, and so just, you know, went, went at it one day at a time. That's wonderful. And, and of course, that's a long journey, but it's, it's really about prototyping. It's really about trying th new things. A lot of what we're learning here in the classroom when we talk about uh, the lean startup and, and how to get something started. Uh, what was your background uh, before starting Papa? Yeah, so uh, I went to school for finance. I was generally good at numbers and I was able to kind of go through that process pretty well. And I thought I wanted to be an investment banker. Um, I'm literally the opposite of the investment bankers. I work with a lot now and trust me, they wouldn't have hired me. Um, but I wanted to learn the framework of building a business and understand how P and L, you know, profit and loss statements work, how income statements work, like how you make revenue and what margin looks like and what goes into all that stuff. And I don't think I realized, but I will say like now that's such a huge part of my responsibility. And until our series uh, B, which is where we raised, uh, I think, um, now I'm actually forgetting how much we raised, uh, you know, $30 million at the time uh, from Comcast Ventures, I did all of the finance myself. And let me tell you, you do learn in school for sure, but having internships and experiences like you guys are getting here at the Idea Center and like real world application has really excelled you know, my, my skills on it. But it helped me to understand perspective from a business point of view. And then what I realized was I'm you know, decent at talking. I could convince people of things like maybe I should be a salesperson. And I did door to door sales. It was the only job I was able to get in the sweltering summers of Miami. That's when I graduated college. Um, in like May of 2010, uh, and it was a very tough job. You know, I wasn't able to get the job I wanted. I never really put the proper effort into getting the job at the early times in terms of internships, which I wish I did, but I had this natural thing. I wanted to work. I really was able to convince people of things that had value, like not, you know, scammy things. And so I started working in, in sales and telecom, and I learned a lot about selling and consultative selling and how to do discovery, which is actually such a critical component of what we do now, which is like, I need to know what our customers want versus telling them what I have, you know? So asking more feedback, getting feedback, and it's not only good for sales, it's good for product development. I mean, when we first started Papa, we were obsessed with this idea of making like a Tinder for older people without the dating element. So it's like, you know, left for, I don't want to deal with the person or right, you know, I would like to spend time with that pal. And that was our idea. We thought that's what you do. You have an idea, you build an app, right? That's kind of like logic to us. We were not technical. We were just kind of salespeople thinking, you know, we could shove you know, this idea into the world and no one used it. And what we found out was our users didn't really want an app. They wanted a phone number. And so my partner, you know, that I was working with was saying, well, oh, we need to rebuild the app. So it does all these other things. I'm like, no, 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 no. I put my life savings into this app. <laughs> We can't rebuild it, I don't even have one more dollar. I gotta either eat dinner tonight or I gotta build a feature in the app. So how do we use the app we have to live in the world that we live in now, which is that our users don't wanna use the app, they want a phone number. So I built a Google uh, phone number, very easy, I'm sure all of you uh, know how to do these things. And uh, they started calling my cell phone directly. And then we used the app, which had this feature, but actually we just had one login. And so when it came to me, I'd say, okay, great, we'll have a pal there on Wednesday. And then I would text the 10 pals that I had hired <laughs> and say, who wants to do it? Here's the password log into my one account so they could accept the visit that I created in the back end. And then they would go, but then they, the day of, they're like, oh crap, I forgot about it because we didn't have a good app. And so 
you know, we just chipped away and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go and be the pal. So I'd be a pal, or my cousin would be the pal, or my co-founder would be the pal, or whatever. And actually at Papa, one of our core values now is be a pal. And so every employee is a pal. I did a visit two months ago. I took a gentleman and his wife to get their passport uh, renewed so they could go to Bolivia and meet with their parents because they were family caregivers. So I started off in finance, really got into sales. And I would say sales is a very heavy part of uh, who I am as a person, um, you know, not as, like oil salesmen, but you know, the oil sales is important. Um, that's an old terminology, slick oil salesman. And, uh, but you know, someone that can describe a product in a very simple way to get the users or those that are getting access to the product to understand it in the most simple terms ever. Uh, and that's what I just keep doing. So a lot of that foundation has helped me uh, with who I am now. That's amazing. So Andrew, we have here uh, students and community members, uh, but mostly students from all disciplines, uh, who some might be studying business, some might not. We have Dr. Brian Stewart, who is the president of our medical campus here, and a couple of medical campus faculty and students as well. For, for that student who doesn't necessarily study business, right, and might not know about finance, right, or yeah. marketing, uh, maybe they are studying nursing, or they are studying the arts, uh, how can they be more entrepreneurial in their journey? And, and is it possible to start something without a business background? A billion percent. I mean, mostly what I think all these things that I've gone through and that you all are going through is perspective. I think perspective is an incredibly powerful concept. Like, in fact, I'd say my job now is mostly focusing on helping others on my team see each other's perspectives or the world's perspectives, not to tell people how to do things. Having finance background, did it help me understand the numbers? You know, maybe, but I, I don't know how to build tech. So did I, how did I do that? I don't know how to code. How did I do that? So you're not going to have all the skills required. It's impossible. So it's really important uh, to bring in others who have skills or recognizing a skill that you don't have. Maybe you're not good at the numbers, so you bring in someone that's good at it. Or maybe you are not good at the coding or you bring in someone that's good at that. And, you know, Papa, I'm just one person. I didn't build Papa. Papa, people built Papa. And so I just happen to be part of this amazing team that I, you know, help be part of. Um, so perspective is critical. And I think, you know, my uncle, who's also an entrepreneur, he actually is a doctor. He went to med school. Uh, he didn't know numbers. I mean, he had, you know, some, you know, level of basic knowledge of it. And, but he had an insight that I would never have had in finance, which was a healthcare insight that he had as a clinician. So if you're psychology, I think that's a very interesting major to understand business because I believe knowing what I've done now that that's understanding viewpoints uh, is one of the most important skills you could have. And you do not have to go to school. To, well, I'm not suggesting you don't go to school, but <laughs> <laughs> everyone leave. <laughs> You don't have, you know, school doesn't have to be what gives you your next thing, or it could give you something that's not work. My, I have four brothers. Uh, you know, one, two of us are entrepreneurial. You know, I'm the one with the company. Um, but my brother Jordan, you know, he is a, a genius and he's a politician and he's going to get into politics and he's trying to change the way the world looks today. So he has a challenge ahead of him and he doesn't go off. He's not going to be a businessman, but that's awesome. He is something he found that he's passionate about. You could tell, I think, that I'm quite passionate about this. So for me, having a perspective and having passion, like everything else is going to work out pretty good if you just go towards that. Hopefully your passion is something positive. <laughs> and w when we talk about the entrepreneurial journey, a lot of times we talk about the good things, right? Uh, and, and, and now you're definitely in a successful moment uh, for, for the company in many ways. Over billion dollar valuation, a unicorn in South Florida, that's a big deal. But I'm sure you've had your, deal, your deals of failure uh, throughout the journey. I'd love for us to learn a little bit more about you know, those pain points, those moments where perhaps it was pretty difficult to go into the office and, and really get the work done. Um, you know, my view on things are, I don't, I haven't full blown failed yet. I mean, we all talk about failure. It is a critical element and it's not, I don't like the word failure. It's kind of negative. I mean, it's a lesson. I, you know, how am I supposed to know everything in advance? That would be like, am I a fortune teller? I would be much more successful if that was true. So you can't figure things out until you go through them. That's in general in life or in work or whatever you're doing. And so I don't think like, oh, I failed. It's like, I mean, it's really, you're going through a challenging moment. I will say, 
it is a serious roller coaster. So like you all see the news and then it seems good. By the time you see the news, we could already be in the trough of sorrow. I mean, and then like people come up to you and like, oh, you did so good with this. And you're like, whoa, whoa, I forgot about that. You know, we're doing something else right now. And so you got to just take everything with a grain of salt. Actually, working at AT&T, one of the best lessons I learned there, I was in this really great uh, post-college program, was that like the only constant is change and you know take everything with a grain of salt and these things sound like very cliche but it's a it's somewhat of a natural thing i you know things go bad all the time for me i just kind of it just go, i don't think about it like that like it just goes off my shoulder one of the interesting feedback i got from my team is that i um, make it seem like everything's so easy hmm. and i'm like well i like came up with an idea and like if i didn't think if it was easy maybe i wouldn't have done it at all i would have been stuck in my house and would have been spinning in circles with all the reasons that it wasn't going to work. And the, just the way I view the world is all the reasons it could work. It's a little bit naive, but, um, and I'm not, you know, there are certain situations when, you know, you shouldn't do that. But if you just have a little bit of confidence, faith, hope, whatever you want to call it in yourself and say like, okay, like I'm going to go down this path, who cares if it doesn't work? It's fine. I can, I can pivot, you know, for the most part. We went into a pandemic and they're like, don't send young people into old people's houses. I'm like, oh my God, that's like literally what we do. But I, not, there wasn't even a second when I said, uh, you know, people ask me like, oh, you were going to fail in that moment. I'm like, oh, I guess like I didn't really think about it like that. It was more like, what do we do to keep going? It wasn't like, what do we do now? We're screwed. It was, well, we, obviously we provide virtual visits. We provide assistance from a distance. We put a little blog, we convince all of our health plans, we got members engaged in technology through telephone or video or whatever they preferred. And we actually found out older people love technology. We actually found out that just no one spent time to teach them how to use it. Um, you know, not, not 100%, but some. And now virtual is a big part of PAPA. And in fact, I think it's enhanced what we're doing. And so that failure, which I wouldn't call it that, was just a moment of learning um, you could full-blown fail, though. I w don't want to pretend like that doesn't happen. And you'll go on, you'll do something else, and you'll, you'll learn in that way. But it's that mindset shift of, of looking at things as an opportunity uh, for growth, which is, which is part of the DNA that we teach when we talk about entrepreneurship here uh, in, in our classes as well. Uh, can you walk us a little bit through um, your, your day? At, at Papa, what what Today does? Or? Yeah, <laughs> right if, if now you here. can if you can pick uh, out snippets, sure. right? Uh, so, what what does the life of a founder look like? And and in the process, give us a little bit of context to those who might not know yeah. uh, how Papa works on a day to day basis, right? Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, it's an interesting question, actually, uh, and it's it's some it's been historically hard to answer. Uh, because it, a lot of times it's like whatever the biggest problem is is in front of me is what I'm working on. Um, and so it can be quite vast. Sometimes it's tech, you know, which I now have a good understanding of it. I don't know how to code, but I could be like, well, it just doesn't make sense. Like why you know, we have this issue, like, so just kind of like, let's break it down. So it's just like hyper-focusing typically on a problem. Uh, another side of my job is hyper-focusing on the future of Papa. And so we've really done a good job. We grow with health plans. The way Papa works is we are a B2B to C platform. We uh, offer our technology and our services to health plans. So Humana, Aetna, Florida Blue, uh, some of them I think are involved in your campus in different ways. Um, you probably have this insurance through your parents most likely, and you get access to dental and vision. And so this also is true for Medicare Advantage, which is privately funded Medicare uh, through health plans. So effectively, Papa uh, sells to the health plans. They pay us a fee, a membership fee effectively, and the pals go out and spend time with their members. And about 10 or 15% of people use Papa, and we, we help them. We find out that they're lonely, we find out that they don't have a car, we see that they haven't taken their medicine, they're not eating, their house is a disaster. All these personal kind of nuances that probably many of you have experienced with your own family members. Um, and so we're constantly thinking about like, okay, how do we help members in more ways? And how do we empower pals to help members in more ways. And we're really focused on tech enabling everything. We have 600 employees. We have 30,000 Papa Pals. This year we'll do like almost 2 million hours of companionship, which we like to say is 140 years of human connection. And so there, that sounds really cool, but there's, and it's really amazing. And we're proving that we're saving lives and like literally, and we're lowering costs and we're improving healthcare. And it's amazing, we're proving that like, being nice to another person is gonna help people help be healthier and happier and like live longer. 
And so like, I think everyone here has known that anecdotally, and we're proving that through, through actually um, controlled studies that are just now coming out. It took five years to get, I mean, by basic, you know, obvious. So what do I work on? I work on the biggest problems that are associated with that, which could be the PAL app is broken, or PALs are getting paid too much or too little, or, you know, the you know, members are complaining, or there's something bad happened or whatever. Um, and then it could be something more like, okay, how do we grow with these help plans? They've grown a lot with us. How do we grow more? Well, we've come up with this thing called Project Treasure Map. It's like a scientific way to grow PAPA. And so I spent a lot of time on Project Treasure Map. And now that we've grown, we have really smart people that are doing things that actually is weird for me because you start to really bring on talented people. And we're only five years old, you know, less than five years ago, I was literally going door to door to, at this campus trying to find and recruit pals. I literally, this last time I was here, was going door to door trying to recruit pals in the building next door. And so like that job is very different than, you know, running a, a billion dollar company. And I, as a CEO, I've had to evolve. I mean, you can't be the same person. And a lot of times they say most CEOs, you know, founders don't always go to the distance. And we'll see if I can. Right now I'm continuously evolving. I'm continuously learning. And I don't expect things to stay the way they are because it's impossible. In fact, I'd say like every four months of my job is almost 100% different. And so it's an interesting thing to get used to and you have to learn and step it up. Like, for example, though I went to school for finance, I will say the advancement of us becoming much more of a financially focused organization, metric driven, tracking every little detail, the data, the insights and all these things and making big decisions based on dashboards is not the same as my gut going in and being like, well, this didn't work and this didn't work. And so you have to shift from like a lot of gut instincts to, um, to data driven instincts. And that's a shift too. So now that's kind of where we're at. I still use my gut, but um, you have to be cautious because if you're like, oh, we're doing this, that could ruin the whole thing over here. You're not even thinking because Papa is a big business now. And it's like a string. You pull on one side of the string and the other side, you know, will ring with a bell. So you got to be thoughtful with things as you expand. So that's a, that's a very intense job. Um, <laughs> I love it. I'm yeah. loving it. It's fun. Mostly. Mostly. <laughs> but it, and it requires motivation and it requires uh, wellness and self-care and and, and looking at you as a leader, how are you taking care of yourself as a I leader? I love that question. Thank you for asking about me. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna let that sit for a second. Uh, no, I mean, it's really important. So, you know, just, uh, I wanna be, I'm very transparent and I love being transparent with my team. And I think a lot of times people are pretty shocked how like open I am with everything that's going on, you know, within a relative framework. And so, you know, we had um, a layoff like a, four months ago. And that was the toughest thing that's ever, I've ever gone through. Like, you know, I think maybe a layoff at a huge corporation is something, but like, I know these people. Like, I've gone to dinners with them. I know their kids and their families. And I even get the chills thinking about it right now. And so the first thing we thought was, okay, we grew too fast on the employee side and we have to make some optimization. So like, we have to do this, but how can we care for these people in the best way possible? And I'll tell you when we went through this, it worked out really well, by the way, and everyone's been put into a really good position, all that stuff. But for us, for me, it weighed on me. It weighed on me hard. And actually, my co-founder went to the hospital. He thought he was having a heart attack. He literally goes, <laughs> he's from Venezuela, he goes, I'm leaving, I'm having a heart attack. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait, hold on. And I'm like, are you okay? You want me to drive me? He's like, no, it's just a heart attack. I'll be back. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's Alfredo in a nutshell. Uh, he was fine. You know, he was just feeling pressure. Um, another co-worker had an issue. So. I, you know, I had a, a similar, not a heart attack, but I was feeling bad too. And stress weighs on you, like, it, like literally it's in your blood, it's in your veins. And so, you know, I think the old way of running a company, which I've seen with my dad and my uncle is like, maybe you don't care about yourself that much. You kind of just build in the business. You maybe like forget about your, not forget, but like maybe you're not spending enough time with your kids. Maybe you're not having those other things, which Papa is so important to me. It's all I do, but I have, you know, a family, I have a life and I have things that are important and the balance and I want to live long and healthy. So I take it very seriously. I actually just signed up for a half marathon in January. I've never done it before. Right. I'm pretty nervous. For the Miami one? Uh, yeah. So okay. maybe some of you guys will. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Hopefully I don't, you know, pass out or die or whatever, but Marlene will have water for me. And so I try to take care of myself too. I actually go to the gym in the middle of the day, almost every single day. I have a block time in my calendar. 
I'm not a gym freak, I'm not a health freak. I'm just trying to like make space for me to have these moments, you know, to meditate. And I actually find I do some of the best stuff running or meditating or just like hanging out or, you know, even on stage here, I'm, I'm thinking about ideas. So, you know, if you're spending all your time working, you sometimes can't see the forest through the trees. And so taking those breaks are, you know, is very important. Um, I really never work middle of the night, ever. I, I kind of never have done that. Um, it depends on what you're doing, you know, it's, um, you know, if you're a coder and an engineer, like some people prefer to work in the middle of the night, you know, it depends on what you're doing. So balance is key. Uh, I'm very into it and I'm not perfect. I'm very, very far from perfect, but I try to be good. I wrote down recently, um, just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at everything. It kind of made me think a lot about life. I don't know. So as I build pop, I try to learn as a human as well. And I hope what you guys are seeing is real talk, right? Like there's no sense in us bringing speakers to our campus community uh, who have it all figured out, right? And that's part of our work here at the Idea Center, figuring things out. We are not perfect in our in our day to day. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to be perfect in many ways, and and it's not realistic. It's really not realistic at all. I'm going to be turning it over to audience questions in just a second. So if you have some questions, feel free to come up to the, to the mic. We're recording. I know I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but we are recording this, so your audio is important. Uh, and I just want to give a shameless plug here to our media services and TV team. Yes. TV team, because you have all done a wonderful job in getting us uh, to have everything functioning today. Do you know actually half of our IT team at Papa is from this college? That's perfect. Yeah, our actual uh, IT, AV, security team is from here. Like three or four of them. Okay, so... We're missing them. Well, maybe. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, I That's didn't do that. I don't poach. I don't poach. They learned here and they're, they're going on to different things. Before I turn it over to the audience, um, and I know I know some students might might leave because of class. No worries. But um, I do want to get your 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 thoughts on on where we are right in Miami right now. Our community. You've met Antonio. Antonio has worked in launching MDC Tech, which is really a, our way as a college to be investing in our local talent that can then go at work at, at companies like Papa. And um, so we got to talk about that afterwards. I love that. Uh, but MDC is really making a concerted effort in being a player in our community as Miami's tech uh, ecosystem continues to evolve. Can you share a few thoughts about where you see Miami and where do you see specifically health tech in, in Miami? So what's happening in Miami in general is mind blowing, obviously. You all, if you're from here, this is like never been seen before. You know, when I was little, I'd come to Miami and it was kind of like more of a tourist thing. And it's obviously changed significantly. And um, when I moved here, you know, Brickell City Center didn't exist. I think like 40 buildings have been added since I moved here. And it was not that long ago, it was 14 years ago, you know, since I moved down to this area. And then when I went to Y Combinator, which is this incubator in California, which I had never heard of in my whole life. I had never heard of, I heard of like private equity. I never really even understood venture capital, like other than like random stories. Uh, and so as someone said, I should apply to Y Combinator. And I'm like, I don't need that. I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna effectively beg people for money. I, and I was cocky about it and I was wrong. And so I applied, but I'm not getting into that. It's like Harvard and Stanford and kids that went from, you know, all these places and they went from Facebook and all this. I'm just a dude from Miami. And so um, none of my friends were in startups. None of my friends had this kind of tech interest, but it's just something I've always, always been obsessed with, you know, more than other people uh, in my, in my, I think in Stanford and California and like maybe like every single person. And it's so beautiful. This room alone is proof like what is happening in Miami. And like, so you're seeing venture capital coming down here. You're seeing uh, incubators coming here. You're seeing Miami Tech Week, Miami NFT Week, all these different things. You know, we know how to throw parties in Miami, as you all know. So um, when I was applying to Y Combinator, we were the only, I believe, company to ever get into Y Combinator. I thought it was a joke. I was deleting my email inbox in the morning and they're like, oh, you, and I'm like, did I just delete? The interview so I went back and you know getting into that gave us exposure and when we were applying no one um, they they were saying well obviously you're gonna move to San Francisco and we're like we haven't decided yet you know we definitely decided we never thought about moving to San Francisco we were just trying to figure it out uh, we lived there for six months for Y Combinator 
But now to see what it is, it's like, oh, you're Miami, oh, you're a genius. Like, uh, you uh, saw it in advance. I'm like, well, really, my mom's a genius. She moved down here in 1992. It was <laughs> Hurricane Andrew and, her and Andrew Parker. Uh, <laughs> one was more destructive than the other. But um, so Miami, what's happening is amazing. It's here to stay. I was just talking to a, a big venture fund uh, the other day. They came to my office, and they're like, this is just the beginning. And like. Hopefully real estate cools down a little bit, but uh, I don't think this is gonna stop. I mean, why wouldn't you live here? Mostly it's beautiful. There's obviously tax benefits for those that, you know, I'm from, from here, so I don't feel the benefit, you know, it hasn't really changed. And it's, you know, a nice place to be. And I think, you know, we have a really amazing mayor, uh, and, you know, in the and Daniel Cava as well, the city of mayors, the county mayors. And so just great people. And I think it's a great place. Everyone's welcome and open and you don't have to see the world one way versus the other. Just come here, be nice, help the people around the community and help build tech. And I think that's what's been most special for me. And our goal here is to make sure that you all as students are participating in that as well. And that it's not just something you hear about in the news, but that you're also getting to see up close. It's real, it's on the ground. You guys can get involved. It's not hard just to reach out and try to figure it out. So I'm gonna turn it over. I think we have several questions uh, and, and we'll, we'll get going. Hi, Andrew. My hey. name is Mark. How are you doing? So I'm also interested in creating a startup, um, a tech startup. And I guess uh, the reason I'm asking this question, or I want to ask this question, is you're mentioning that when you were starting, you wanted to quit your job to start the business, your business full time. And it sounds like you sank most of your money into it. And I guess that's something that's the point where I'm actually at. And I guess I was hoping maybe you can just elaborate a little bit about maybe the, the mindset, the, the feelings, the thoughts yeah. that someone needs to, uh, you know, to move forward from where they are now yeah. to creating the new like mental pathways to say, okay, this is something that I'm going to do. It's going to be work and it's okay. But just that whole idea to move yeah. from here to there, you know, I, I, for, for me, I thought about what is the worst that could happen? I mean, it definitely depends on everyone's situation, you know? And so for me, I just had no responsibilities in terms of the things to spend money on other than my rent. And, and so I mean, it could have been a little bit of night. I was a little naive, to be honest. Um, and I just was so interested in building something real that I just thought, I would be in much more pain if I look back and say, shit, I didn't do it. And uh, I could have done it, and then now I can't because I have this responsibility or that responsibility or whatever I make up at the time, uh, which it isn't always made up. Sometimes it's authentic. And so I think you can always come up with reasons not to do stuff, and that's okay. But if you just realize that not, nothing bad will happen for the most part, and if it does, you'll figure it out too, because you're smart and you're caring and you're thoughtful. And you know, getting a job is something everyone in this room can do. And if you do need to do that, you can. Or if you need to do something on the weekend, or if you need to go online and sell stuff on eBay, um, I've done crazy stuff, you know, like that. And it worked out. It definitely worked out. I don't want to pretend like it's a, it's a guarantee. It, it may not work out. So you just got to realize that this is the reality of wanting to get behind something. Every person that you see now, like almost every single person that's famous or rich or started a big company, whatever, they went through the struggle too and they didn't know the answer either. They just said, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna do it. So that's my personal advice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mark. You. Thanks, Mark. Good luck. How you doing, man? Good to meet you. Nice meeting you, Adrian. Good to see you. Um, in talking about financing, right? Yeah. How did you come up with like, membership uh cutting through bureaucracy i guess of healthcare right approaching the health company do you have five say. hours <laughs> <laughs> and then um and then maybe like the second part of that question is approaching like series a and series b yeah um but i guess when you were first getting started establishing like what's the cost how much does this product cost yeah. well first you have to know how much it costs you to be able to make a decision on how much you should charge and so it's going to work backwards that way. So we, in the beginning, which we didn't do it right, honestly, but in the beginning, we we're like, okay, Papa is, we would sell to consumers, but then health plans were saying, okay, there's 50 cents per member per month. So we came up with this idea that they should pay us like an admin fee or a license fee, which is very common in the healthcare industry. Um, and so we use some examples of things that have worked in the past with other businesses. So a good start is to say, okay, I'm selling, you know, cars online. Well, what is another company that sells cars online? Or, you know, I want to sell on-demand Band-Aids. I just made that up. Uh, and so Band-Aids cost five bucks, but you're getting it on-demand. There's a delivery fee that costs two bucks. Now we're at seven. 
oh, uh, maybe I could charge nine for a pack of Band-Aids. And then I get the, you know, I get that small percentage. So you kind of work backwards to say, how much does it cost me? And then, uh, and then also you got to test it. We actually use this pretty cool platform I just remembered, which was testing consumer behavior. Uh, there are tools now that exist that do that. So you could put in 45 year old, you know, person from South Florida with this income level. And then actually it sends out surveys and you say, would you pay 20, you know, for this? And they have different methods to be able to do that. That actually helped. So just testing and iterating. Every single thing in a startup is testing and iterating. You mostly won't know the answers in advance, but just if you test and iterate, you will get to the right answer. Things that seem like the right answer when you're sitting in a room with your co-founder, your friend or whatever, that not always is the answer. You know, for us, there's many examples of that. Um, and I could go into those in details, but for fundraising, you know, that's a completely different thing. You have to really know your data. You have to know your numbers. In the beginning, it's storytelling. And if you have a big market, on-demand Band-Aid is not a big market. Actually, raise your hand if you use the Band-Aid. Have you used the Band-Aid? Let's see how big the market is. <laughs> I think most people in here have used the Band-Aid. Maybe it is a big market. So you look at the total, total adjustable market. So Papa, there's 50 million seniors. There's 250 million people on, uh, in health plans and commercial benefits. There's, there's 300 million seniors in China. So the market is massive uh, and growing. And so investors love big markets. They love powerful, passionate teams. They love people that have kind of said, OK, we're going to figure out some stuff. We figured out these few things. So in the beginning, it's about the storytelling and showing the vision and the right team uh, in a big market. But then as you go more down the line, and that's why I got a CFO around Series C. I should have done it in Series B. Um, but anyway, lesson learned there. See, it wasn't a failure. It was just a lesson. So uh, fundraising is tough uh, for Series A. I reached out to 50 people, got the 48 no's. You guys have heard the stories. Um, but I didn't think about 48 failures. I just said, I'm going to keep calling until someone says yes. And so I thought it was pretty good on 50. When you say someone says yes, you mean someone cut you a check? Gives me money, hey, yes, that's get yes. Get started, I believe in you. You know, it's not, it's not done until the, uh, oh, yeah. you know, someone sings. That's awesome. That was a great question, Aiden. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Yeah? Hi, my name's um, Zachary. So, um, as a, as a CEO, right, you would see yourself as a leader. Um, so like most of us here, some of us are leaders in our own clubs and stuff like that. What advice would you give to, I guess, seem like what, what can help make a better leader or make an aspiring leader to be, you know, yeah. someone people can look up to? That's a good question. I don't, um, so this is my first time having any person report to me in any way, shape or form. Uh, I did have an intern for like six weeks one time, but... Other than that, I had no exposure to what it's like to manage people or lead people. And so honestly, I do it um, in the way that I would want to be led, which is just by supporting uh, people. I'm not a dictator. That's a that's the type that some people are. Maybe you could tell kind of how I would lead. I'm just a person and we're trying to figure it out together. And you run marketing, so I could just give you my thoughts and maybe we work on something together on like, what are the guardrails? But you're in charge. Uh, you know, of this place. I'm just here to help make sure you can be successful. I remove blockers. You know, I help you think through whether or not this is important. You know, I make sure that you're being measured, but I'm being measured too. Like if we say we're going to do X and we do minus version of that X, that's not their fault. That's our fault. We're a team. And so and you've seen the memes like the guy in the back or the front, you know, that's all fine. But I think it's just more about like being a human being, being helpful and being caring. Um, I think that inspires people the, the most. I'm not like waking up every day thinking like, how do I inspire people? I'm just waking up and saying, how do I help the team? How do I grow Papa? And I think that, you know, tends to lend to someone saying, All right, this is the leader that we want to be around. Right. And I just had um, one more question. No problem. Um, you know, as a business person, was there ever a moment where you really like sat down with like, okay, this is really messing my head. How do I get over that? Like, have you ever had that real head scratcher moment? Um, I mean, yes. So s some of the fundraising, I will say, was very tough. You know, and they change their minds and they come back and they're, you know, you, you put all your energy into it. Oh, they said yes. And then they're like, just kidding. And it's very <laughs> intense. But did I go back and say, <laughs> I probably said, they're idiots. <laughs> um, but I don't think... 
it's just not in my nature to do that. I'm just like a glass half full person. So I don't want to pretend like that's super easy for everyone. Um, so everyone has their process. It's okay to question yourself. My co-founder, I will say, and I, I wouldn't say that if I didn't know he was not comfortable, sometimes he questions himself and says, wow, I'm running a billion dollar company. I'm just some dude from Venezuela. How the hell am I doing this? You know, and so I think there's like this imposter syndrome that happens to some people. Uh, maybe I'm cocky ass because I don't think that way, but I think it is fine to think that, you know what, this is tough. Like maybe I screwed up or I didn't do right by this person. And the only thing you can do is just get up the next morning and say, okay, this is what I messed up on. I'm going to own up to it. I do it all the time. Guys, I screwed up. This is 100% my fault. And, you know, you don't want to have that every day, but to be able to take ownership of both your successes and, and your mistakes or areas you could have done better is, is critical. So it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary. Joy? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Joy. My name is Joy, and I ha actually have two questions. Similar to what he said, I'm interested to know what type of struggles did you face with starting your business, and how did you overcome it? So every day there are different struggles. I'll say that I, what I said earlier, I'm like a, a, like a dog with a bone or however you want to frame it. And so when I see a problem, I actually get really energized. So when things go wrong, I get more focused. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Biker Boys when they get the tunnel vision from, you know, it's a 15 year old movie, but pretty cool movie. Anyway, uh, they would get this tunnel vision when they're racing and they would just be so hyper like focused and insanely you know, putting all of their attention on this one thing. And when I have that happen, I actually feel more energized. In fact, when some of the times when that's missing, I like miss, it's kind of a little bit crazy, but I miss the feeling of like, there's a huge problem we need to resolve. And like, I just boom, 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 boom. And it's kind of like, I shut off the meetings. Marlene goes into hyper mode as well. And we just focus exclusively on that, that problem. And thankfully I'm doing that less and less and less, uh, but there's always something. So. Again, it goes back to the same thing. Take it with a grain of salt. That's part of the process. You're not just going to push the rock up the hill and it's going to fly up to the top. You're going to have bumps. And if you expect those things, they're not failures. They're just part of the path. I'm reading this book I highly recommend with Audible, uh, to be honest. Uh, and it's uh, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, his voice, as you all know, is it's just wonderful. And it's called Pro uh, Green Light. And he's just talking about, like, you're going to hit all these bumps. And you're going to hit these bumps, but then you get a green light. And uh, it helped me actually this weekend run five miles for the first time ever. So, could use it in different ways. Thank, Thank you. you for your question, Joy. Thank you, Joy. The last question I have is, what differentiates um, Papa from being a caretaker? So, Pop, the primary thing is actually we don't do bathing and toileting, which sounds like something that we're not doing. And so, like, wow, you're missing a feature. But only like 12% of people need bathing and toileting. And those companies are focused on like 40 hours a week. We're focused on like two, three, four hours a week. We're more like light touch pre-care. They're like more home care. So there's doctors, there's nurses, there's caregivers. And now we've invented a new kind of care built on human connection, which we call pals. So I like to tell the team, wow, it's like we invented, you know, the new doctor. Um, pretty cool. It's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a student here at Miami Dade College, and I wanted to ask you. I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I'm only going to ask two. No, okay. One, uh, one so that we can get to the other two. Yeah, please. Well, you, can, you can ask I, me I after. Can ask you but yes, but Andrew, will stick around just for a few more minutes after. Hey, I would like to ask, also as a CEO, but for now, as a person, what inspires you? I mean, this inspires me. Um, I think I'm driven by passion, and I'm just really passionate about what we're doing at Papa. When I was, and it's, we say at Papa that we're not a check the box culture, that we just don't do things because the world's saying you do it. We do things because we care. We really are meaningfully trying to move the needle on things that matter and not just to say, oh, we did this, we did this, we did this, so we're good. That's not at all. So what is interesting is when I was little, my friends used to make fun of me calling me a social butterfly, which was really, I'm doing what I do now. I, you know, I go around and talk to people. I like being around people. I'm obsessed with my friendships and my family, and it's like, People joke, like, if you call me, I answer in less than a second, and I'll talk to you for hours, even in the middle of the day. And it's because it's who I am. I'm a human person. I'm a connector. And so just by chance, it was a problem I noticed with my grandfather, and now, I'm a so, you know, now I run a company that provides social butterflies. We call them pals. Um, and so it's just like what I found is people are what drives my passion. Like, I'm, I get so much energy in, in these things. And um, in fact, I never really liked being alone. I've learned to cope with it myself, uh, but I think 
I'm really powered by passion, which is driven by people. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Chris. much. Thank you. We got a couple more. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. Hey, so Sophia. I work really closely with dementia patients, which sounds kind of similar to what you do, except they might not all have dementia. Yeah. But one thing that I kind of thought about was, how do you guys train the volunteers, or is there some form of training not necessarily physically because you guys don't do the bathing and any of that, yeah. but emotionally how they know how to interact with the people and kind of understand like the patience that goes behind yeah. dealing with them and understanding their emotional needs. So a uh, great question and it's amazing what you're doing. Uh, Papa, my grandfather had uh, passed away of Alzheimer's and it's a terrible uh, disease. Um, and dementia is part of that obviously. So we do what's called neurodiversity training to understand different cognitive approaches to life and dementia, you know, obviously there could be forgetfulness or irritability and things like that. So we're not training them on how to physically care for them, but from an emotional perspective and really to be sympathetic and empathetic more so to their situation um, and know how to handle the situation. An older person with dementia could be irate, they could scream, they could, and so um, it's a part of Pal University. And if they do have a member with these issues that actually it'll come up uh, and pre-refer uh, this to them in advance, a little video, a little quiz. In fact, in the early days of PAPA, we worked with a study in patients with dementia and Alzheimer's at the Miami Jewish Health System, which is uh, a little bit more north of here. And it was a program where the PALS would go and sit with the members uh, and do brain games and spend time with them in between their MRI appointments and their scannings, and they'd take them back uh, to and from home. So it gave them dignity. Um, you know, though there may be some forgetfulness, we were able to handle that. That said, if someone is at an extreme, you know, end of the spectrum, uh, we partner with our health plans and we'll bring in a specialist for cognitive issues of that kind. Um, but mostly we're on the lower end and people are fine and you just got to be prepared for the situation. Thank you You so should much. apply to be a pal. Uh, it's not volunteer, by the way. You get paid on average about 25 an hour. So it's welcome, great, everyone. It's a good uh, <laughs> opportunity. And Sophia, thank you for that question. We actually have a neuroscience of aging certificate here. Oh, really? At, uh, at the college. And so Maybe we, can incorporate uh, it. We, we definitely will follow up with you all on that. You got a tech enabler that can't have people coming to a location. Hey, how's it going? I'm Andrew as well. Nice actually. to meet you, Andrew. Pretty good uh, so name. My question is uh, really about product market fit and when you encountered that and if by any chance it was between that seed, seed stage and Series A round. So, uh, product, well, yes and yes, I guess. Um, <laughs> so when I, f I thought we had product market fit when my friend agreed to offer Papa to her grandmother, Olga. That was like when I was like, wow, we got this one person to use it. I just didn't really know what product market fit was, obviously. Um, but that was the early stages of it, at least give us inclination that maybe, but we didn't get product market fit for a while after that. In fact, I went door to door, I went to homes and facilities and here, and I went everywhere I could possibly go, taking my door to door sales uh, skills uh, to, the, to the streets, um, and it wasn't working, actually. And this is before we had the phone number, and it was, um, we thought we had a pivot. And we're like, oh, we have this app. We could give it to home care. It could be a software or whatever. And then what I realized was like, oh, well, we did have product market fit. We had Olga, we had this other person, we had five or six people. And uh, then we realized we actually had a bad business. So we had product market fit, but we were losing all of our money, you know, pretty much. We were spending too much on marketing and the customer wasn't staying on the platform long enough. And I always wanted to be in healthcare. Health plans is what I sold. So I was cold calling this whole time while my other parts of my team was managing this early consumer business, which gave us revenue. We got up to like 50 grand a month in revenue, but it was kind of going out of a leaky bucket, which we learned during Y Combinator. But during Y Combinator, uh, government approved companionship as a benefit to Medicare. We had already been cold calling Medicare uh, health plans and Humana decided to work with us. And that's when I'm like, oh my God, this is true product market fit. It's profitable, we're connected, all those things. Uh, and we shut down consumer completely. We, we turned off the consumer uh, business and it was really a focus thing. And it sounded crazy, like, oh my God, we're making like 300 grand a year on something that we just started six months ago. What the hell, are we insane? And I actually, at the time, Alexis Ohanian was our investor, uh, who he was with Initialize from, from Reddit. Um, and his wife actually has her own fund now as well, Serena Williams. Uh, and I said, and he's a consumer guy. I go, dude, we're gonna shut down consumer. And it wasn't up to him really, but I just wanted, he was a genius consumer marketer, like he's literally the best. And he goes, 
I believe in the founders 100%. If this health plan deal is important, let's do it. And we did it, and it was the best decision ever. We focus exclusively on health plans. And in fact, if you call right now to get Papa, unfortunately, we don't actually support consumers unless you get it through your insurance. And it's because focus is so key. So we found that about 10 months in, uh, when I would say we officially got product market fit in a business model that's viable now. However, we will be opening up consumer eventually, and I think there's time, and we used to always say, it's not about product market fit if with Papa, this is how big of a need it is, not everything has that, but it's about when. And so right now we focus on health plans, maybe later we'll focus on other things. In fact, we expanded to employers, Bank of America offers this to their employees, Delta offers this to their employees, so family caregivers, which is effectively consumer, so maybe one day you'll see a billboard that says, you know, come to Papa or something. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, um, I want one more question, Tarsha. Hey, Tarsha, last one. No, I'm just kidding. Just sort of. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Tarsha Adams Felton. I actually work here at the Idea Center. I'm one of the team members here. But my, my thing is not a question. It's a compliment. Um, me being a caregiver myself, and I want to commend you on, on the effort that you take to build a billion dollar health um, company. Um, it's much needed. It's much needed. Thank you so much. Um, and especially the part about the PALS, that just blew me away because oh. we need a lot of people to take care of other people that can't take care of themselves. So I compliment you. Oh, on thank you so I, much. I, I appreciate it. Keep doing it and keep going. I won't stop, I promise. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. There's no better way to close off than, than with that comment. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. We have quite an interesting group of people here today. We have our students. Everything we do here is for our students. We have also members of our Scale Up Miami family. Our alumni of Scale Up Miami are here. I want to thank you all for joining us and for being part of this series. Uh, we have community members here as well, and we have faculty and staff. And that's the beauty of what it is to be in a university environment, in a college environment, where we can bring people together, where we can convene business leaders and our internal community and create those synergies and those moments of collisions. I encourage you all to network and meet with each other. And I know that Andrew might stick around for just a couple more minutes because he's got to go back to, to Papa. Um, I actually have to go to the airport. To, to the airport. Uh, so, uh, but thank you all. And we'll be back. And we're very excited. It's going to be the uh, Cesar Conde, uh, who is now in, over at NBC Universal and used to oversee Telemundo. So we're very excited. Uh, and we hope to see you all on December 2nd in our West Campus. One big last uh, uh, hand of applause for Andrew. And thank you all for joining us.